Hi, I'm Jamie. Instead of a story this week, I decided to read a handbook. A handbook is kind of a reference type of book where you'd go to look up things you wanted to learn more about. This particular one is called the Firefighter's Handbook, and it's written by Megan McCarthy. Off goes the alarm and down the pole the firefighter goes. No one knows what's ahead, but firefighters work hard to train in fire academy. Firefighters are tough and prepared for anything. Do you have what it takes to be a firefighter? Read Firefighter's Handbook and see. So that's what we're going to do. Welcome. Soon you'll learn everything you need to know to become a firefighter. The training is hard, but the job is harder, so be prepared. You'll have to pass some tough tests to become a firefighter. One test is called the Candidate Physical Ability Test, CPAT. To, pay, to prepare for that test, you should try pull-ups and running and push-ups and bike riding and walking and squats or climbing stairs. Because when it's time for your CPAT, here are some of the tests you'll, be, you'll need to pass. A stair climb. You'll have to wear 75 pounds on a vest and walk a stair climber for three minutes. Or the hose drag. You must drag a hose around an obstacle and walk 100 feet, which is about the length of a basketball court. The equipment carry asks you to grab two heavy saws and carry them 75 feet, and that tests your muscles, because firefighters need to be strong. They'll also test your ability to search. You must climb through a dark maze that has obstacles and narrow spaces. That's what searching in a fire would look like. And then finally, the rescue drag. Rescuing someone in a fire is the most important job for a firefighter, and you must drag a dummy 70 feet. And the dummy weighs 165 pounds. Firefighters are team players. Being helpful and learning to share and getting along are all important traits for a firefighter to have. It's also important to have a good sense of right and wrong. And before, before you become a firefighter, you need to be interviewed. An interview means sitting with the fire captain and answering some questions about yourself and why you want to be a firefighter. Congratulations, you've made it to the academy. Now you're a probie, which is short for proba probationary firefighter. And becoming a probie means the learning has just begun. You'll wear several pieces of equipment that are important to protect firefighters. An SCBA face piece, which seals in your face and prevents smoky air from coming in. SCBA stands for self-contained breathing apparatus. Your uniform will have a voice amplifier, a flashlight, and the uniform has knee pads and reflective stripes used to make the fire to fighter more visible. You'll have a helmet that protects your head from falling objects. They come in different colors depending on your rank. And there's a number on the front to help identify the firefighter. You'll get gloves to protect your hands from hot objects. And turnout gear, sometimes called bunker gear. That's what firefighters call their pants and jacket. The fabric is flame, heat, and water resistant, and the inner layers wick water away from the body. The gear can be different colors, mostly black or different shades of tan, though forest fighters generally wear yellow. And what the color is usually based on the tradition of the fire department you belong to. Some of the 
tools you'll take with you or a thermal imaging camera that's used to so show areas of heat in dark smoke-filled smoke environments where it's hard to see through walls or doors, a chainsaw and a sledgehammer, wooden door chucks used to prop doors open, a pickhead axe, and a halligan bar which is a multi-purpose tool that has three parts, the claw, the duck bill, and the pike. And it's used for prying and breaking doors and locks as an anchor to escape out of a window or to hold car hoods open or break glass or turn gas meter valves on and off. You'll ride in either a fire truck or an engine. A fire truck is like a giant toolbox carrying tools to break down doors, cut holes for ventilation, and much more. There are different kinds of trucks with different kinds of ladders, some made to reach the tops of very tall city buildings. Fire engines carry water, pumps and hoses to put out fires. <clears throat> Both engines and ladders have many compartments that hold fire hose couplings and adapters, fire extinguishers, axes, a toolbox, extra breathing tanks, and other important equipment for the firefighters. There are different places where you can work as a firefighter that, might, that you might not think of, like on the ocean, in a fireboat, or at the airport, or in the forest. What kind of firefighter would you like to be? You can't be afraid of heights. Some truck ladders go very high. And you also might need to be comfortable going up and down ropes. If you work for the Forest Service, you may have to rappel out of a helicopter. You'll train at the academy at something that looks like a movie set. And you'll practice putting out fires and saving dummies inside the buildings. You may also need to be trained as a paramedic. A paramedic responds to 911 medical calls, gives CPR, bandages wounds, and stabilizes a patient and gives life support because you're the first line of defense when dealing with sick or injured patients. Once the patients are stabilized, they're rushed to the hospital where the doctors will take over. As a firefighter, you may go on many emergency calls, and not all of them involve fire. A hydraulic tool named the Jaws of Life will help you pry and cut metal, and your training as a paramedic will help you to help the injured. Once you make it through the fire academy, you'll be assigned to a fire station. You'll likely work 10, 24-hour shifts per month. That means you'll be spending a lot of time at the fire station. You'll eat there, you'll hang out there, and even sleep there. Your firefighter team will become your second family. There can be a lot of downtime, so you'll also have chores, like cleaning dishes and mopping floors and washing off the fire trucks. And after many hours of chores, you can sit back and relax. But you always need to be ready for a fire. You need to drop what you're doing, slide down the pole, put on your gear and jump into the fire truck and go. But you're ready. You've trained for this and prepared well. Now you can put out that fire and save lives. So do you want to be a fire person, a firefighter? It's something I thought about when I was young. Maybe you need to look through the fireman's handbook. Thanks, and bye. A story about ducks is a tale of a group of ducks who tired of their quiet little river in the country and decided to take a holiday. On their adventure, they ate raspberry buns, ride a roller coaster, and narrow escape being someone's Christmas dinner. The story is written by Jack Townend and was 
written in about 1945. I was about two then. There once were some ducks who lived on a little river in the country. It was a very pleasant little river, but the ducks sometimes grew very tired of always living in the same place. And they longed to go somewhere new and have different things to eat. So one fine morning, the ducks decided to go for a holiday. The big brown duck said if they were back on the river by nightfall, they couldn't possibly get lost. And the little red duck and the little white duck, who were called William and Mary, were so excited they couldn't even eat breakfast. Not even one little worm. Ew. As soon as they had left the river, the ducks waddled across the fields, singing as they went, and soon they came to a road where they sat down to rest their feet. I wonder who might have built that road. Do you remember a story about Ben? Ben was the steamroller. Uh, he was used to build roads, and he met a friend called Matilda. I wonder if this was the road that he built. They hadn't been sitting very long when two little birds came and perched on the fence. And when they saw the ducks, they looked very surprised and said, Go back to your river, you foolish ducks. Something terrible will happen to you if you go any further. But the ducks only laughed at the two little birds and thought how stupid they must be. How could anything terrible happen to them when they were going for a holiday? And they were not going very far and would certainly be back before nightfall. They sat and talked for a while by the roadside and then up came a baker in his van. He was going to the town to sell his raspberry buns at the fair and he asked the ducks if they would like to come along with him. So the ducks climbed up on top of the van and were soon rolling away down the road and over the hills. When they reached the fair, the ducks jumped down from the top of the van and thanked the baker for their jolly ride. He gave them each a raspberry bun and then they hurried off to see all the wonderful things at the fair. There were roundabouts and swings galore and ice cream carts as well. But best of all, there was a great big switchback which went twirling, whirling high into the sky. The ducks did so want to go on the switchback, but they hadn't any money to give the man. So little Mary laid him a beautiful pale blue egg, and he said they could all have a ride. It was lovely on the switchback, high up in the sky, then down again, and up again, and down again, and round about, and in and out, till all the ducks felt quite dizzy. William and Mary laughed so much they almost fell out, but the big red duck caught hold of them just in time, and they were saved. Just as they were having a really wonderful time, the ducks heard some men talking in very low voices. Whose are those ducks, said one of the men. I don't know, said another. And the third man said, well, we can't have ducks just running loose like that. We'll have to catch them. And the men started to run towards the ducks, waving their arms in the air and shouting, hi there, come back, you ducks. But the ducks didn't come back. They were off running as fast as ever they could and screaming at each other all the time. They ran and ran and ran, but the men could run faster than the ducks, and they soon caught up with them. They picked the ducks up and fastened them up in a wooden box. It was very frightening to be shut up in a wooden box, and the ducks pushed their heads out of the holes in the sides and squawked and squawked until their throats were quite sore. Then, who should come along but the two little birds they had met by the roadside? And the little birds laughed to themselves and said, We told you so, you foolish ducks. We told you something terrible would happen to you. Then all the ducks felt ashamed, and they said to the little birds, Tell us, tell us, little birds, what will happen to us now? 
you'll be taken away, replied the birds, and you'll be someone's Christmas dinner. And sure enough, the ducks were right again, for along came a porter from the railway station, and on the wooden box, he stuck a label which said, Ducks for Christmas. Then he put the box onto a trolley, and off he went to the station, pulling the ducks behind him. We told you so, we told you so, shouted the little birds. But this time the ducks said nothing. They were too busy looking at the label on the box. And anyway, they had all squawked so much they had no more squawks left in them. When they reached the station, the ducks were bundled onto the platform and very soon the signal went down and the train came chugging along the line. As soon as the train stopped at the station, the ducks were put into a truck at the back. The guard waved his green flag, the engine whistled, and off they went. It was very dark inside the truck, and all the ducks were very sad, thinking first about their nice quiet river which they would never see again, and then maybe being taken for Christmas dinner with a family. It was a horrible thought. Then all at once William had an idea. He pushed his head as far out of the box as ever he could, and he squeezed up his body until it was almost small enough to go through one of the holes. Then all the other ducks pushed him from behind, and very soon he came out of the box with a great big pop. Mary came out the same way, and between them they pecked at the lock on the box until it came undone, and straight away all the ducks flew out of the box and out of the truck and into the sky. Higher and higher they flew, flapping their wings as hard as ever they could and eager to get back to their quiet little river where no one would run after them and shut them up in a box. We're out, we're out, they cried, and we're not going to be at a Christmas dinner at all. Then they flew and flew until they landed in the river with a big splash, which frightened all the fishes for miles around. The two little birds who had flown after them sat in a tree and looked down at the ducks. You clever, clever ducks, they said. You'll all be together at Christmas now. But again the ducks said nothing. They were much too tired after their long journey. They washed their faces, ate a hurried supper of worms and duckweed, and very soon they were all fast asleep. So that's the story of the ducks, written by Jack Townend. Next time we're going to have another one. So we've had the story about Ben. We've had the story about the ducks. And next time we're going to read the story about Jenny, the pink Jeep. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joe, and I'm here today to read you a story called Tim O'Toole and the Wee Folk. It's an Irish tale told and illustrated by Gerald McDermott, which is really funny because my dog's name is McDermott. So here we go. In a little co cottage on a little hill, at the end of a little lane in Donegal lived Tim O'Toole and his wife Kathleen. Tim and Kate were so poor, they had not a penny or a potato between them. Their children ate porridge for supper. Even the mice were thin from want of food, and the cat wouldn't bother with chasing creatures. Their neighbors, who were poor enough themselves, avoided Tim, for they thought he would bring bad luck to them. Things went from bad to worse until one day there was not a crumb or a drop left in the house. Tim O'Toole, said Kate, I can stand no more of being poor and you sitting around bemoaning your fate. You must go out to find work like a decent man and take us out of this poverty. Kathleen kept after him and the next morning Tim set out to see if he could earn some wages. Tim O'Toole traveled the length of the county, knocking at every door, inquiring at every farm, trying to eke out a few coppers for a day's work. But there was no work to be had. Finally, when Tim was tired and hungry and could walk no further, he stopped and lay down to rest on the cool green grass 
uh, clover at the side of the road. No sooner had he stretched out than he heard the faint sound of merry piping and lilting voices raised in song and laughter. The strange music was coming from a little hollow in the side of the hill. Tim crept up to the hollow and peered over the edge. There below him was a troop of wee folks laughing and singing and carrying on. Do you know what a wee folk is? It's also called a leprechaun. Well, Tim knew this for sure. His luck had changed, for it was well known that whoever spies the wee folk in the light of day can demand their treasure. Suddenly the music stopped. The little merrymakers were astonished when they looked up and saw Tim peering down at them. Hand over your gold, bellowed Tim, trying to be fierce, and you'll come to no harm. Have mercy on us, Tim O'Toole, begged the leader of the little people. There was a smile on his lips, and he tried not to laugh. You've caught us for fear, so we'll see that you're richly rewarded. Then there was hurrying and scurrying in the hollow below, and soon the wee folk handed up a little gray goose. Here you are, Tim, a goose that lays golden eggs. Go home straight away. Tell not a soul, and you and your Kate shall never want for more. Tim started for home, carrying the goose and feeling pretty, very pleased with himself. Soon darkness overcame, and he stopped at a farmhouse to ask if he could stay for the night. The couple who owned the farm, the Magoons, let him in and sat and sat him down by the fire. Tim began to boast of his great good fortune and the little gray goose that laid golden eggs. Didn't they tell him not to tell a soul? Hmm. That night, while Tim was asleep in the loft, the Magoons decided they could use just such a goose at, as this. Quietly, they exchanged it for their own. Tim was none the wiser for it, and in the morning went happily homeward, carrying the goose he thought would bring great wealth. When he got, when he got home, he put the bird down on the table. Is this all you've got to show for being gone these three days? asked Kathleen. But darling, this is no ordinary goose, said Tim. This one lays golden eggs. Well, the short of it is they waited a long, long time, and as you might guess, the goose did no such thing. That's because he had the wrong goose. His goose got switched. They've cheated me, howled Tim, and he marched off in a terrible temper to give the little people what for. When he finally reached their hiding place, he was still angry. Golden eggs, is it? Tim cried to the wee folk. That goose you gave me laid no eggs at all. This is curious indeed, said the startled leader. Then the little man wrinkled his nose and gave a sly smile. Tim, wait but a moment and we'll make good on your reward. There was hurrying and scurrying in the hollow below. A moment later, the wee folk brought out a fine linen tablecloth and spread it in front of Tim. In the wink of an eye, it was covered with bounteous food and drink, the likes of which he had never seen before. Take this tablecloth home straight away, Tim O'Toole, and tell not a soul. <coughs> Excuse me. Caution the leader of the little ones. Then you and your darling Kate shall never want for more. Tim walked merrily toward home until darkness came on him. Again, he stayed the night with the Magoons and boasted to them of his newfound fortune. I thought he wasn't supposed to tell a soul, but he went and told the Magoons again. The Magoons thought it was good fortune indeed. While Tim slept, they slipped away the magic tablecloth and exchanged it for an ordinary one from their very own cupboard. Tim was none the wiser for it when he reached home the next day. Kathleen, my darling, had, he said, we'll never go hungry again. With a flourish, he spread the cloth upon the table. Well, of course, it was empty and produced not a crumb. Kathleen laughed. Tim went into a rage. The little heathens, he shouted. 
In a flash, Tim was out the door and on the road again. Stand fast, Tim called down to the little hollow where the we folk were gathered. Tis pleased you... "'Tis pleased you are not, Tim O'Toole," said the leader. "'Could it be that the tablecloth was empty?' "'All the wee folk were grinning. "'Indeed it was, you scoundrel,' answered Tim. "'The wee ones began to chuckle. "'And did you go direct home, as we told you?' "'Tim O'Toole, Tim O'Toole admitted he had twice stayed the night at the Magoons. "'When they heard this, the little people burst into laughter.' You are a fool to trust the likes of the Magoons, said the leader, but never mind him. We just, we've just the thing for you. The little people brought up a strange green hat and gave it to Tim. They instructed him to boast of its magic to the Magoons and to leave the hat where they could find it. Then we shall see what we shall see, said the wee one. A third time, Tim tarried at the Magoons, he proudly displayed the magic hat that the wee folk had given him. Then he crawled up into the loft and pretended to sleep. He had but laid his head upon the straw when he heard the Magoon stir below. I wonder what sort of magic it is, said Magoon and his, to his wife. Curiously, he tipped over the hat. Out of the hat jumped ten tiny men. Each had a little black thorn club and began to beat the Magoon's about the shins and ankles. The couple whooped and hollered and danced around the room, trying to escape the blows of the wee folk. Lay off, lay off, begged Magoon. Tell your henchmen to give mercy, O'Toole. Give me my linen tablecloth and my little gray goose, and I'll leave you in peace, said Tim, laughing all the while. <coughs> the Magoons gave back what they had taken. Tim put on his hat, tucked the little gray goose under his arm, draped the tablecloth over the other arm, and headed for home. When Tim arrived, he spread the tablecloth before Kathleen and set down the goose in the middle of it. The bird honked and laid a golden egg. Then the most delectable edibles and drinkables began magically appearing on the table. Kathleen, my darling, said Tim, we are happy at last, or so Tim thought. Folks from all parts soon heard, the, heard of the O'Toole's good fortune and crowded in to see their wondrous goose. The little co cottage filled up with neighbors until there was no place left to sit or stand. Everyone helped themselves to the never-ending supply of eatables and drinkables. I never knew we had so many friends, said Tim. But I think tis time the party was at an end. Tim tipped his hat and out jumped ten tiny men with black thorn clubs, they beat the shins and ankles of the noisy crowd, chased them out of the house, and pursued them down the hill. After that, the cottage was quiet once again. Tim O'Toole and his family were quite comfortable, you might say. They spent many hours in front of the hearth, sipping hot tea and chatting, and thinking, all, thinking kind thoughts of the wee folk. For all I know, Tim and Kate are still there in a little cottage, on a little hill at the end of a little lane in Donegal. The end. Thank you for listening. See you next time. Hello, my name is Diane Dowd, and I have a couple of my favorite books to share with you today. Um, the first one is part of a series of books called I Can Read It All By Myself. This series started in 1957 by Dr. Seuss with A Cat in the Hat. So probably a lot of your parents and grandparents, when they were beginner readers, read these books, as well as you have probably read them too. But this is one of my favorites. It's Are You My Mother, written and illustrated by P.D. Eastman in 1960. A mother bird sat on her egg. The egg jumped. Uh-oh, said the mother bird. My baby will be here. He will want to eat. The egg jumped. It jumped and jumped and jumped. Out came the baby bird. Where is my mother, he said. He looked for her. He looked up. He did not see her. He looked down. 
He did not see her. I will go and look for her, he said. So away he went. Down, out of the tree he went. Down, down, down. It was a long way down. The baby bird could not fly. He could not fly, but he could walk. Now I will go and find my mother, he said. He did not know what his mother looked like. He went right by her. He did not see her. He came to a kitten. Are you my mother, he said to the kitten. The kitten just looked and looked. It did not say a thing. The kitten was not his mother, so he went on. Then he came to a hen. Are you my mother, he said to the hen. No, said the hen. The kitten was not his mother. The hen was not his mother. So the baby bird went on. I have to find my mother, he said. But where? Where is she? Where could she be? Then he came to a dog. Are you my mother, he said to the dog. I'm not your mother. I'm a dog, said the dog. The kitten was not his mother. The hen was not his mother. The dog was not his mother. So the baby bird went on. Now he came to a cow. Are you my mother, he said to the cow. How could I be your mother, said the cow. I am a cow. The kitten and the hen were not his mother. The dog and the cow were not his mother. Did he have a mother? I did have a mother, said the baby bird. I know I did. I have to find her. I will. I will. Now the baby bird did not walk. He ran. Then he saw a cow. A car, I'm sorry. Could that old thing be his mother? No, it could not. The baby bird did not stop. He ran on and on. Now he looked way, way down. He saw a boat. There she is, said the baby bird. He called to the boat, but the boat did not stop. The boat went on. He looked way, way up. He saw a big plane. Here I am, mother, he called out. But the plane did not stop. The plane went on. Just then, the baby bird saw a big thing. This must be his mother. There she is, he said. There is my mother. He ran right up to it. Mother, mother, here I am, mother, he said to the big thing. But the big thing just said, snort. Oh, you are not my mother, said the baby bird. You are a snort. I have to get out of here. But the baby bird could not get away. The snort went up. It went way, way up. And up, up, up went the baby bird. But now, where was the snort going? Oh, 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 what is this snort going to do to me? Get me out of here. Just then, the snort came to a stop. Where am I, said the baby bird. I want to go home. I want my mother. Then something happened. The snort put that baby bird right back in the tree. The baby bird was home. Just then, the mother bird came back to the tree. Do you know who I am? She said to her baby. Yes, I know who you are, said the baby bird. You are not a kitten. You are not a hen. You are not a dog. You are not a cow. You are not a boat or a plane or a snort. You are a bird and you are my mother. I hope you enjoyed that.
for my second book. This is totally different than this one, but it's a favorite. It was written in 1991 by Peggy Rathman, and she also did the illustrations for this. It's called Ruby the Copycat. And Ruby, Ruby the Copycat is about a little girl named Ruby who is going to be the new child in school. She doesn't know a soul, and you can imagine how frightening that is when you're about six and you go into school and you know no one. So let's find out what Ruby did and what she learned along the way. Ruby the copycat. Monday was Ruby's first day in Miss Hart's class. Class, this is Ruby, announced Miss Hart. Ruby, you may use the empty desk behind Angela. Angela is the girl with the pretty red bow in her hair. Angela smiled at Ruby. Ruby smiled at Angela's bow, and she tiptoed to her seat. I hope everyone had a pleasant weekend, said Miss Hart. Does anyone have something to share? I was the flower girl at my sister's wedding, said Angela. That's exciting, said Miss Hart. Ruby raised her hand halfway. I was the flower girl at my sister's wedding, too. What a coincidence, said Miss Hart. Angela turned and smiled at Ruby. Ruby smiled at the top of Angela's head. Class, please take out your reading books, said Miss Hart. At lunchtime, Ruby hopped all the way home on one foot. When Ruby came back to school, she was wearing a red bow in her head. She slid into her seat behind Angela. I like your bow, whispered Angela. I like yours too, whispered Ruby. Class, please take out your math books, said Miss Hart. On Tuesday morning, Angela wore a sweater with daisies on it. At lunchtime, Ruby hopped home sideways. When Ruby came back to school after lunch, she was wearing a sweater with daisies on it. I like your sweater, whispered Angela. I like yours too, whispered Ruby. On Wednesday, Angela wore a hand-painted t-shirt with matching sneakers. After lunch, Ruby hopped back to school wearing a hand-painted t-shirt with matching sneakers. Why are you sitting like that, whispered Angela. Wet paint, said Ruby. She had painted her shirt and sneakers. On Thursday morning, during sharing time, Angela modeled the flower girl dress she wore at her sister's wedding. Ruby modeled her flower dress too, right after lunch. Angela didn't whisper anything. Angela's a little upset, if you can imagine. By coincidence, on Friday morning, both girls wore red and lavender striped dresses. At lunchtime, Angela raced home. When Angela came back to school, she was wearing black. On Friday afternoon, Miss Hart asked everyone to write a short poem. Who would like to read first, asked Miss Hart. Angela raised her hand. She stood by her desk and read, I had a cat I could not see because it stayed in back of me. It was a very loyal pet. It's sad we never really met. That was very good, said Miss Hart. Now who's next? Miss Hart looked around the room. Ruby? Ruby stood and recited slowly. I had a nice pet who I never met because it always stayed behind me, and I'm sure it was a cat, too. Ruby smiled at the back of Angela's head. Someone whispered. Ruby sat down. Hmm, what a coincidence, murmured Miss Hart. Angela scribbled something on a piece of paper. She passed it to Ruby. The note said, 
You copied me. I'm telling Miss Hart. P.S. I hate your hair that way. Ruby buried her chin in the collar of her blouse. A big tear rolled down her nose and plopped onto the note. When the bell rang, Miss Hart sent everyone home except Ruby. Miss Hart closed the door of the schoolroom and sat on the edge of Ruby's desk. Ruby, dear, she said gently, you don't need to copy everything Angela does. You can be anything you want to be, but be Ruby first. I like Ruby. Miss Hart smiled at Ruby. Ruby smiled at Miss Hart's beautiful polished fingernails. Have a nice weekend, said Miss Hart. Have a nice weekend, said Ruby. On Monday morning, Miss Hart said, I hope everyone had a pleasant weekend. I did. I went to the opera. Miss Hart looked around the room. Does anyone else have something to share? Ruby waved her hand. Glued to every finger was a pink plastic fingernail. I went to the opera too, said Ruby. She did not, whispered Angela. Miss Hart folded her hands and looked very serious. Ruby, dear, said Miss Hart gently, did you do anything else this weekend? Ruby peeled off a fingernail. I hopped, said Ruby. The class giggled. Ruby's ears turned red. But I did. I hopped around the picnic table 10 times. Ruby looked around the room. Watch. Ruby sprang from her desk. She hopped forward. She hopped backward. She hopped sideways with both eyes shut. The class cheered and clapped their hands to the beat of Ruby's feet. Ruby was the best hopper they had ever seen. Miss Hart turned on the tape player and said, follow the leader, do the Ruby hop. So Ruby led the class around the room while everyone copied her. And at noon, Ruby and Angela hopped home for lunch. The end. And what I think this showed you was that Ruby didn't have to be like everyone else to fit in. She just showed them who she really was. And she was so much, it was so much fun just to be herself. And that's it. Thanks.